Few drivers have arrived in Formula One with as much obvious potential as Oscar Piastri. Oscar Piastri wins the Formula Two Championship of 2021. Three titles in a row for the Australian driver, Formula Renault, Formula Three, and now Formula Two, F1. Sign him up. Oscar was on a roll, but an F1 team couldn't sign him up straight away. There was no room on the grid in 2022, and he had to take a year out from racing. Now he has his chance. Time to prove himself at the very top and become a hero for Australia, like his role models, Weber and Ricardo. I'd always wake up in the morning hoping that Mark had won. You know, it was the same when Daniel went to Red Bull as well. You know, I'd always wake up seeing if, if Daniel had won, and you know, it was always exciting when he had. Hopefully one day I'd like to be in the same position and hopefully someone's thinking that about me. Hello, it's Tom Clarkson here and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid with McLaren's Oscar Piastri, the rookie with a huge amount of expectation on his shoulders this season. There are reasons to expect great things. He won three junior titles in a row and that kind of record suggests he's destined to be an F1 frontrunner. Piastri tells me what he learned from all those successes and the journey that led to them. A journey that involved leaving home for a different continent, going to boarding school on the other side of the world, and even playing a little bit of cricket along the way. Mark Webber, Red Bull's former race winner, has played a big role as Piastri's mentor. The 2022 tug of war between McLaren and Alpine is behind them now, but it's put more pressure on Piastri than most F1 debutants. He's convinced McLaren are the best fit for him and that he and Lando Norris will push the team forward together. Oscar and I sat down ahead of this weekend's Australian Grand Prix in his home city of Melbourne. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Oscar, it is great to have you on the show. How are things? Uh, very good, thank you. Very good. And of course, it's still early days. But how are you finding F1 so far? Yeah, I've been enjoying it. Uh, it's been exciting and obviously something I've worked towards for a very, very long time. Uh, I think I started racing about 12 years ago now. So, um, yeah, just enjoying it. It's been, been busy, but uh, it's very cool to say I'm an F1 driver, that's for sure. Are you settled? Have you, do you feel like you've got your feet under the table now at McLaren? I think so, yeah. Everyone's been great in welcoming me to the team. And I think, you know, obviously I've been trying to spend as much time at the factory as I can, both preparing myself uh, and trying to help the team, but also just getting to know people and put names to faces and stuff like that. And I think, you know, now that we've got the first race uh, under our belt together, there's, you know, it just adds to the level of the relationship that you've got with, you know, all the mechanics on your side of the garage and stuff like that. So, no, I feel like I'm in a good spot. Uh, very happy to be at McLaren and uh, it's been going well, I think. Is the names and the number of people the biggest difference to everything you've experienced in racing before? Honestly, I would say yes. It, like, it sounds a bit weird to say that's the biggest difference, but just the the scale of you know the team is is so much more i think in f2 there was maybe 30 people at a rough guess uh for for the whole team uh and you know we've got probably close to 100 people trackside at the team and that's not to you know that doesn't count the other how many it is six or seven hundred back at the factory that are you know building the car and uh helping us back from mission control at mtc on the race weekend so uh, it's a bit different when you've got to remember 800 names or try uh, compared to 30. Even the 100 that we've got at the track or however many it is, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a challenge. So that's probably the biggest difference, I would say. And you know, I got a bit of experience with it last year being reserve driver, getting to try and get used to the world of F1 and try and remember names at that team as well. But yeah, it's uh, a different process from what I've raced before. How are you finding the driving bit? Because in this car, you've only had, what, one and a half days testing. I know there was some running in, in the old car at various tracks, but do you feel on top of the car now? I'd say close. I think there's, you know, obviously always, I guess, room to improve. And I think especially with one and a half days of testing each, you know, I think you're naturally going to be still evolving at the start of the year. So... I feel like I've got a good idea of, of you know what I need to do to get the most out of the car and how the car needs to be driven. It's just putting it into action and 
getting it to become second nature to drive. So I think there's still improvements to make, but I feel like I've got a, a good idea and I think it's going in the right direction. And what about the pace of the McLaren? A lot was said, particularly at the first race, about you're not where you want to be. In a way, does that help you? Are there advantages to learning your craft away from the spotlight? A little bit, I guess. Um, of course, you know, I, I want to be as high up on the grid as I can be. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that I would prefer to be down down the back or, you know, not, not fighting for points. But in some ways, it, it does take the spotlight off a little bit. Um, you know, obviously, I think a lot of people have high expectations of McLaren and, you know, we have high expectations of ourselves to try and be fighting for points and, and for this year, try and get uh, into the top four teams which is you know now that Aston Martin is now part of that top four it's uh, I guess a, a bigger challenge but still one that we're we're trying to achieve so I think that's what we're working towards but I think at the moment it, it you know I wouldn't say if there's I, th- I think the right way to put it is if there's any time to to be I guess a little bit not where we want to be the first few races is probably the time to have it. Now can we throw it back and talk about your early life and how how you came to be a racing driver because when you look at the other young guns on the grid it's been all about racing for them since birth and i'm talking verstappen leclerc Sainz, albon magnuson their dads all raced what was the case with you uh so for me i'm the first in my family to to race myself i think there's always been an interest throughout my family my uh granddad and my pop, so my mum's dad and my dad's dad, were both mechanics. Racing mechanics? No, just, just, just regular mechanics. And my dad's business is in the automotive industry. And, you know, they've always had a passion for, for cars, first and foremost, but also racing as well. And, yeah, I think it's it's naturally gone through the generations to myself. And uh, it actually started with a business trip for my dad. He brought back a remote control car from the US to Australia and... I started just driving that around the backyard and, and the school oval at, at one point when I was, I think, six or seven. And then I started racing that not long after that. And it all kind of went from there. So uh, a bit of a different entry to motorsport. I didn't start karting until I was about, I think, nine or ten years old. That, that's how Lewis Hamilton first mm. got into racing, yes. actually, was, was remote. For, look, for those who don't know, and I'm definitely one, what does remote control car racing actually look like? So the cars, the cars that I raced initially were one eighth scale, and then I went to uh, one tenth scale. Formula One cars or rally no, cars? No, so or? they look like they look like touring cars in a way. I think they do have Formula One cars, but like the uh, let's say the pinnacle of remote control car racing is like touring cars, and and they're they're quick. You know, they go up to probably 110 kilometers an hour on on the straight oh, wow. top speed, and and the acceleration uh, is insane and of course they only weigh a kilo and a half or something so it's you know they're pretty impressive pieces of of kit and you stand on like a a driver stand with your radio and obviously you control it from that and uh yeah it's it's pretty it gets pretty intense and and you aged nine Mm -hmm. are beating adults right yeah so there's no age (laughs) brackets or limits or boundaries or stuff so uh, I was, yeah, often competing against people in their 20s, 30s. I, I won the national championships, I think, when I was nine. I think the next youngest guy was 18. Uh, <laughs> so that was that was nice. But yeah, like there and was... Did that involve, like, travelling all over Australia? When it got more serious, yes. When, yeah, like a similar story to how I was in karting, really. You know, started out in sort of club level remote control racing and then did a couple of races, like, in, in New South Wales, in Sydney... I think we had one race in Brisbane, but a lot of it was was still local racing within the state. So for Australia, it's not actually that close. You know, the closest track to our house was I think 45 minutes or something like that, and you know, Brisbane's a two-hour flight away. So it's not not that local, but it started to get a bit more interstate at the end. But I mean, compared to what karting ended up being, and then obviously now the rest of my career it, it looks pretty small in comparison well look, with my f1 umbrella on i'm trying to think how did that help you prepare for formula one and i suppose the fine motor skills in your hands a little bit yes i think like the almost the technical side of things helped at, at the start because honestly there's probably more things you can change on a remote control car than there are on most race cars um you know you can change springs on the on the shocks you can change toe camber all the sort of normal things but you've got 
tire warmers, tire additives. Hang on, tire warmers. Tire right. warmers, <laughs> uh, tire additives. So you know you can put stuff on the tires to make them grippier and stuff like that. And um, and you did all of that. You did all of that because you had to to be quick. So you know that technical side of things was sort of. I got a. I, let's say a, I wouldn't wasn't an expert, but I had a, a you know a brief understanding of of what certain setup items did and you know i knew what a racing line was and stuff like that so when i went into karting uh, obviously it's very different standing with a remote control car compared to sitting in the car or go-kart but the idea of a racing line and setup stuff like that um you know i kind of had a, a an introduction to it let's say of what what to do well, look, tell us about the move into carts then. What happened? Tell, there must be a story. Where was it? Was um, it a lightning bolt moment for you in that this is what I want to do? Uh, at the beginning, actually not really. Um, so, uh, you know, I think in the remote control car community, there's obviously some crossover to, to the racing car community. So there was, there was some people there that dabbled in go-karts or, or above. Uh, and one of our friends or one of my dad's friends had a, had a daughter who uh, he bought a go-kart for. And they started racing a little bit, and then one day they asked if I wanted to go. I had to go, and uh, and loved it. And the next week I had my own in in the garage at home. So it all started from there. And I think at the beginning, you know, I was still debating: do I want to race remote control cars still, or, or go karts? And pretty quickly, go karts started to win. So um, it it went from there, and then yeah, now here we are. Was it the driving sensation that you liked, or was it the competition? I think a bit of both. I loved initially the speed, of course. I think that's what most people love. But then it was a combination of, I would say, a lot of competition, but not just with other people, with myself. Like just wanting to be better and better and get my lap times quicker, find out different things on how to drive and how to set up the go-kart and stuff. Uh, and then, of course, when you throw that in against other people, you've got a benchmark of, of whether it's uh, whether you're in the ballpark or not. So... For me, I think the competition was a massive draw card, and you know, even even now, I think you know, I much rather do practice sessions and qualifying and races with other people than testing by myself. I had uh, a year of that, so I I know what I like now. I think, but um, yeah, the competition was really what got me involved in the first place. And you know, I was a competitive kid before I got into racing with with all the sport that I played, and even at school, you know, I wanted to be the smartest kid and stuff like that. So I think it's sort of just ingrained God, that's me. music as a parent that's music to my ears if <laughs> i was your if i was your dad i want to be the smartest kid so it, academically as well as sporting yeah. you're a high achiever oscar i uh, yeah so th that was one of the the rules for my parents of going racing was uh, remote control car racing was initially normally on a wednesday night after school so thursday morning was always interesting to try and go to school um but the the rule from my parents was you can go racing but your grades have got to stay you know at, at the same level and that was especially true when i was in australia still racing there because you know at that point you never know where racing is going to lead it's it's obviously a very cutthroat sport and there's only a handful of people that you know firstly get to f1 but also just the professional drive in motorsport you know it's it's not an easy thing to come by so that was sort of the, uh, I guess, backup plan, if you want to call that. And I, you know, even when I moved to Europe in 2016, I still went to school. I went to boarding school for four years and, and did my GCSEs and A-levels in the UK. And then, yeah, I think after that, uh, I finished school before my F3 season. Uh, and then the F3 season went, went very well. I won. And I think at that point, the education side of things was sort of a little no, bit no, more I in the back No, no, I want to just go to university. <laughs> yeah, at that point, it took a bit of a backseat. I think the last year of school, my attendance was like 36 or 7%. And I was at boarding school, so I was living at school. So that, and yet you were still only And it was still 36 or 37%. So by the end, it was, was tough to, to manage both. Did school understand? Yeah, they'd had a few people uh, before me through, through racing. racing. Yeah, so uh, Callum Eilot, uh went there before I did, and they'd had a, a number of people that went on to be professional sports players, so a few rugby players, a couple of cricket players. So they, I guess, understood to an extent, and you know, if they they were very supportive. It was more or less, a, you know, you can you can go and do it as long as you achieve the matriculation grades, which everyone has to do to stay in the school. As long as you do that, then. Uh, you know, that's, that's fine. This episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens. 
If you're a regular listener to our shows, you'll know that I started taking AG1 because I was looking for a way to optimize full body health without the need for buying multiple vitamins and supplements. And I found it to be the perfect addition to my health and fitness regime. That's because AG1 is so much more than a nutritional drink. It's all your key health products, multivitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics working together to help you balance your immune system, improve energy and focus, and even support long-term gut health so your whole body can thrive. With just one scoop mixed in water, you're getting 75 high-quality ingredients that you might not even realize your body is craving. It's become an integral part of my daily routine and I really notice a difference in my energy levels on the days I work out when I take AG1. My recovery time is much better and if I take it first thing in the morning, I feel much more hydrated and ready to tackle the day. It's such a small change to my routine that reaps huge benefits. I love the fact that it's delivered monthly so I can stay consistent and they even provide travel packs so I can take it with me on the road as well. So if you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash F1BTG. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash F1BTG. Check it out. So did you play a lot of sport while in England outside of your racing career? It was tricky. So the school that I went to in the uh, winter term played rugby. So that was obviously quite a big no-no. One, I'm not the biggest of people. So yeah, don't fancy my chances of rugby. Scrum but half, I see you then. Yeah, maybe not. But uh, Controlling the game from the back of it. Yeah, <laughs> but just the risk of injury in rugby was, was obviously too high and we all know that motorsport is an expensive sport, um, so you know I wasn't going to jeopardise you know anyone that was was funding my racing by playing rugby. Uh, and then, yeah, when you're an Aussie, cricket, cricket, yes, cricket was pretty much the main sport that I used to play. So in the summer, I, I would play cricket. I had one game in the firsts at school. Are you a batsman or a bowler? Well, I'd say a bowler, but I wasn't great at either. And my game in the Hang first. On, if you're in the first, so well, the best team in the school. Right? Slight caveat to that. It may or may not have been because the summer term was always when the sixth formers had their uh, exams, A-level exams. So one, they were on study leave and then they would finish. So I may or may not have got my appearance because everyone else had left, <laughs> but that, that's in the fine print. So I've got the cap. I've got my, I think my name signed on the door now uh, at school. So that was my one appearance of my claim so to fame. So there used to be a Formula One cricket match before the British Grand Prix, right? We should bring it back. Well, if we brought it back, what have you got to offer? Are you are you going to bowl or are you going to bat? Where are we at? I would probably be better at bowling, so I would say. Piastri is opening the bowling and batting number? Uh, in the second half somewhere. Actually, funny story. I played uh, a cricket match, uh, when was it? A couple of years ago with Alpine at the time and we were playing some uh, local team. As the well, first up near the factory in, up near the, in factory, the UK. Yes. I hadn't played cricket since I left school, I think a couple of years before that. And uh, the first ball that I bowled back, I was, was chatting to someone from the team, said, imagine if you get a wicket on the first ball. And sure enough, it happened on the first ball. Uh, it was a terrible ball, but the, the batsman, I think, nicked it to So what do you bowl? Slip. Uh, well, I want to say medium pace. Medium but pace. It's medium, slow sort of on the stumps uh, is what i would call so yeah i i try when i was a little kid i was i was not bad but yeah now as soon as racing came into the Oscar, scene you know that Rick, ricky ponting uh, adam gilchrist massive f1 fans likely to be in melbourne this year mm -hmm. yeah I've, uh, I've got a, a cricket bat signed by ricky actually when okay. i was a I, I can't remember how young i was but uh, six or seven, I think, and we we actually did a photo shoot with him for something. My my uncle is a photographer, and it ended up being on the 
back page of the cricket, like the local cricket rule book for, I think it still is. Uh, so if you look at the local cricket rule book in Victoria or Melbourne, there's probably still a photo of me and Ricky Ponting, me when I'm about seven years old at the MCG. So that's uh, awesome. fun fact. Because of course, for people who don't know, you grew up in Brighton. I'm not talking Brighton in the UK. I'm talking Brighton near Melbourne. Yes. Did you go to the MCG a lot? Of course, 15 minutes from Albert Park itself. Yep. Um, yeah, I went uh, a fair bit, I would say. Like, I, I watched the odd cricket game here and there. As a little kid, I, I wasn't super interested in test match cricket at, at the time. So I watched a lot of 2020s and one-day games, uh, a few AFL games as well. And then, yeah, Albert Park was, was actually so close to my house that I didn't really need to go and watch them because I could hear them from my backyard. So in the VAD era anyway, that was. But... Yeah, I, a lot of sport and just loved it as a kid. And you were a grid boy, am I right in saying this? Uh, was it 2014? Uh, I think... 20, at Albert Park? 2014 or 2015, I think. One of one of the two years. But I, yeah, I was a, a grid kid for Danny Kvyat, actually, which I reminded him when we crossed paths a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'm sure he, he remembered. Yeah, well, no, he wouldn't have remembered because he broke down on the way to the grid for that race. So uh, oh I never no, actually got to a, see him. An empty grid box. Exactly, oh, yeah. So uh, I was holding his flag for the, the national anthem and I've had an empty spot in front of me. So uh, there you go. But uh, yeah, it was, it, you know, we were speaking about it a couple of years ago when we ran into each other. And uh, yeah, funny how such a small world it is, you know, eight years ago. I was holding the flag and, and you know, now I'm uh, on the grid myself and someone will be holding mine. When this comes out, you will, uh, you'll you'll probably be touching down in Melbourne. What does it mean to be racing at home for you? What's that going to be like? Uh, it's probably going to be, I mean, first, it's going to be awesome. And, you know, it's amazing to have not just the home race in Australia, but in, you know, in Melbourne. Um, for me, being 10 or 15 minutes away from the track is it's the closest home race I've ever had. I and mean, I think probably the closest home race a driver can ever have. You know, it's closer than my local go-kart track when I was a kid. So, yeah. Is it true that this is going to be your first race in Australia since you were karting? Yes. Yeah. So it'll be my first time on an Australian racetrack, full stop, and not a, not a go-kart track. So it's a bit weird to say that. Uh, and, you know, it's almost uh, after all these years, it's been seven or eight years since I raced in Australia. It's going to be a bit a bit weird to be racing at home again, um, but it'll be an awesome experience. And everyone's coming to watch, right? I imagine you've had a million requests for passes and... and See, that's I why I have Mark and Anne man <laughs> managing my corner, so I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> of um, Mark Webber and Neil, of course. Yes. We'll, we'll but, come on to them in a minute. But yeah, I'm sure they've had a million and one requests. I know I've had a, a few myself, but... Um, yeah, it'll but be nice. mum, dad and sisters will be there? Yes, yeah, they'll all be there. I'm sure some aunties and uncles and grandparents will be there too and some friends. So, yeah, it'll be a very nice experience to have everyone now, there. I remember uh, Mark Webber, actually, and Daniel Ricciardo saying that your home race, particularly in Australia, is hard. And managing your time, particularly pre-race, is really hard. What are you expecting and how are you going to deal with the barrage of requests? Uh, I think, you know, firstly, I've got a very good team around me, Mark and Anne. Uh, obviously, Mark has been in that position for however long his F1 career was, over, over 10 years, close to 15 years. So, you know, he's had that experience and obviously McLaren as well has had Daniel uh, at the Grand Prix for the last couple of years too. So I think from all angles, we've got experience with the Grand Prix and myself last year went as reserve driver. And even that experience of, of just being there as a reserve driver was insane. Uh, you know, the, the amount of people and the support that I had and I wasn't even racing was, uh, was pretty nuts. So I've got a, a good idea of what to expect this year, I think. Hopefully it's, it's another step uh, even crazier. But no, it'll be awesome. And, I'm, you know, I think we've got a very good team to, to try and juggle everything that will come in that week. Let's talk about Mark Webber now. Because, of course, not only can he help you around moments like the build-up to your home race. But, you know, he's also, I feel, lived a lot of what you've lived in, that he did the thing of moving from Australia to Europe to further his career. How has Mark helped you across everything? In more ways than I could think of, to be honest. Um, you know, I think 
I first started working with Mark uh, and Anne at the end of 2019 or start of 2020. And at that point, you know, it was quite behind the scenes, you know, making sure my, my contracts at, at Prema and stuff were sorted. Um, so that was just before your Formula 3 season? Just before my F3 yeah. season. Um, and, you know, I think my 2019, I won the Formula Renault Euro Cup Championship. And, you know, at that point, F3 was uh, was the next step, and and that that was the first time I'd be on an F1 weekend. Um, I was joining an F1 academy at the time, so I think it, at that point it was my dad and I, and uh, and someone else called Rob who was was helping us. But really, we needed someone with more experience, uh, and you know, Mark helped a lot with that for the first couple of years. But was also, you know, I think 2020 was difficult with COVID, um, and we we're in separate bubbles all the time, so we we didn't actually do much together that year. Um, but that was a really intense year because, it was a because very of COVID, year, yes. it was like, what was it, nine races in 11 weeks or 11 in 13? I yeah, can't for F3, our season was, yeah, nine weekends in, uh, yeah, nine out of 11 weekends. And, and that was it for our season. So our season was like, uh, yeah, it was like seven, 77 days, I think it was, the, for the whole season. It was intense. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was intense to say the least. But I mean, at that point, you know, I'd just finished school. There wasn't much going on in the world because nothing could happen. Uh, and, you know, you tell however old I was at the time, 18 or 19, uh, you know, you're going to race race cars for nine weekends out of 11. That sounded pretty good to me. I'm sure the mechanic said otherwise, <laughs> but uh, at that time I, I loved it. You know, T- the idea talking was good. about the intensity of 2020, weren't you sitting A-levels that year? So that was almost a bit of a blessing in disguise uh, with COVID. I mean, not much good came from COVID, but... I was supposed to have my exams during my F3 season. I think one of them was scheduled for like the Monday morning after one of the rounds and they ended up getting cancelled because of COVID. So I went home for the Melbourne Grand Prix and then obviously got cancelled. We were supposed to race in Bahrain the next week for our opener and it got cancelled and then you know, we, we didn't go back until I think start of July for the first round in Austria. So in that time period I was firstly at home in Melbourne so ironically was the longest stint I've had at home since I left eight eight years ago and it meant my exams got cancelled so it sort of cleared that hurdle before the season started and then once the season started I could just fully focus on racing which was the first time I've been able to do that for well ever it was the first time your exams get cancelled if anyone asks you just say you got straight A's Pretty well, no. <laughs> Is I, that I mean, how it I, works? N- not quite. I wish I did get grades. Uh, I think I got two Bs and a, a but C. But based or on what you've just told me, you didn't sit them. Yeah. So for me, it was quite tricky because I think it went off like coursework and you know uh, internal exams and stuff like that. It was up to the schools to send in the grades to the the sort of I guess governing body, if you want to call it that, and and they would standardise them. For me, you know, I passed my my. Ex- exams if you want to call that i passed school um so i was pretty happy either way and it meant established I could go you're a high achiever it was three a's if anyone really <laughs> wants to know right okay what were your subjects actually That's uh maths physics and computer science so very engineery subjects. right uh, and i've i've read that had you not become a racing driver maybe engineering would have been yeah i uh, i think so you know i've always enjoyed the the technical side of the sport and I think for me, you know, I think now seeing the hours that the engineers put in, I'm not so sure I'd be <laughs> cut out for it. But, you know, I've always enjoyed that side of things. And it's such an important part of going racing. You know, we it's it's one of the probably the most talked about topics in motorsport of, you know, is it the driver of the car? Ultimately, it's a mixture of both. But the car plays a, a massive role in your success, you know, not just in any series, but in particular F1 because everyone's building their own cars, obviously. So I've always liked that side of things, and I think it's important to have a good understanding of it too. So it kind of helped whilst I was racing and was almost, uh, if I, if this doesn't go to plan when I'm at school and, and stuff like that, then um, you know I can still be involved in the world of motorsport somehow. There's more to come from Oscar in just a minute. But first, let's talk about money. We live in a world that's more digital than ever, with nearly every want or need just a tap away. There are so many of our favourite digital services that we regularly rely on that seamlessly meet the physical world when they're delivered directly to our front door. Whether that's shopping on your favourite online store or a subscription service that you just can't live without. But until now, that hasn't been true for crypto. 
digital currencies like crypto have been tied up online with no easy way to bring them into the real world. That's why we're so excited to share that you can now cash in and out of select digital wallets at participating MoneyGram locations without a bank credit card or debit card, giving you so much more freedom and control over your money, knowing that the balance on the screen can be converted into cash directly in your pocket. Flex your finances using the only digital wallets with real cash access activated by MoneyGram. Learn more at MoneyGram.com forward slash Stellar Wallets. That's MoneyGram.com forward slash Stellar Wallets. Oscar, back to Weber. Can we say he was a hero of yours growing up? Um, I, I don't know if I would say hero, but... He was, so I started watching F1 in 2009 properly. Um, so Can you even, no, you weren't even, you weren't even one when he did that amazing fifth place for Minardi in 2002. Uh, so no, you don't remember no, that. No, no I, I don't remember <laughs> it at all. So I started properly watching 2009. Braun came in and yeah, wiped the floor with everyone, uh, which Mark, yeah, doesn't like being reminded of. But I started watching then and obviously Mark was the only Aussie at that time. Uh, so I naturally started watching him. And then obviously Red Bull had their, their dominant four years with, with him and Seb. So I kind of would always watch. And of course, being an Aussie, I always hoped that I would, you know, at that time I was still in Australia. So I would, uh, and the races were at two or three in the morning before school because of the time difference. So I'd always wake up in the morning hoping that Mark had won, which, which happened a few times. Uh, I'm sure he would have liked more, but it was always exciting to, to see, you know, whether he'd won or not. And, uh, you know, it was the same when, when Daniel went to Red Bull as well. You know, I'd always wake up seeing if, if Daniel had won and, you know, it was always exciting when he had or, or Mark had as well. So it's, you know, kind of a nice feeling that hopefully one day I'd like to be in the same position and hopefully someone's thinking that about me. You've said already that one of the reasons you wanted Mark batting for you was because you needed someone who with more experience in this world. But was Mark able to help you with not jet lag, but homesickness, really. When you know, when you moved at the age of 14 to England, it must have been really hard. Uh, has Mark been able to give you any advice about that? Uh, I mean, Did you not, suffer from homesickness? Not, I wouldn't say he gave me that much advice, but I didn't feel like I really needed too much as well. I think by the time that Mark came into my corner, I'd been away from home for uh, pretty much four years at that point. And I think actually school was a very good way of not forgetting, but almost a distraction from both racing and thinking about racing 24 seven, because that's never particularly helpful if it's all the time, every time, but also, you know, from being away from my family as well. Uh, you know, it was basically like living with a bunch of friends at boarding school, which was nice. And I guess all your mates are away from their families as well. Yes, exactly. You know, some all of the some of, some of the really half an hour down the road, not across the world, but yeah, same same principle. Um, you know, there was there was a few international students there, so it was was nice. And you know, I think I've always been quite a an independent person as well. And I think you know. There's always some sense of, I guess, freedom. Um, so I think, you know, by by the time Mark came on board, I think I was 18. So by that point, I was probably, you know, considering moving away from home, regardless of what I was doing. Probably not to the other side of the world, but yeah. So I I, I wouldn't say I've really struggled with that too much. Of course, I love going back home whenever I get the opportunity, which is now really once a year. I've actually added myself another trip because of the race in Melbourne. So. Uh, that's a win, but so um, in the winter and then again in yeah, March, so over April. Christmas and then over uh, March, April, yeah. So and I guess you can stay out a little bit after the race because we've got the long gap to Baku as well. Yes, I, I actually need to come back to Europe straight after the race this year, so uh, I unfortunately I won't. I'll be going out a little bit early to you know see my friends and family and stuff before all the the chaos of the race begins, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it'll be nice to have that second trip home. Has Mark helped you as a racing driver in, you know, the, the, the cockpit bit? I think so. But I think, you know, up until this point, firstly, you know, being in F2 and F3, Mark's not driven those cars. And obviously the cars are, are very different from when he drove. And I was in incredibly capable hands at Prema as well. So there wasn't really the, I guess, need for him to to meddle too much with that because it was was going 
pretty well, quite frankly, as well. And I think in F1, just the attention to detail and, um, you know, obviously in the junior categories, all the cars are the same spec for everyone. It's, you know, you get given the same car, same engine and a few setup uh, changes you can make. Whereas in F1, obviously you've got each team making their own car, different development pathways, different areas of the car that you can develop. So I think the knowledge on that side of things he's been very, very helpful with. Um, but also the cars nowadays are very different to when he raced. So the little intricacies of what finds you the extra half a tenth or a tenth might not necessarily be the same, but all the things that in the background can add that extra bit of performance, um, he's been incredibly helpful for. Crossing the line to take seventh place and the Formula 3 Championship, Oscar Piastri has won the title. What a thrilling way to crown a brilliant achievement. Oscar Piastri is the 2020 FIA Formula 3 Champion. Yeah! Yeah, boys, we did it! Oscar Piastri wins the Formula 2 Championship of 2021. Three titles in a row for the Australian driver, Formula Renault, Formula 3, and now... Formula 2, F1, sign him up. Let's talk a little bit more about your junior career in single seaters. I can't think of a driver with a more impressive CV than you, Oscar. You know, champion in Formula Renault, Formula 3, Formula 2 in consecutive seasons. What do you think is your greatest strength as a driver? I think... It's, it's probably consistency, and I would like to hope consistently quick as well. Uh, that always helps. But I think in those three championships, you know, especially the Formula 3 season, uh, I had some qualifying woes, shall we call it. I didn't qualify on the front row. My teammate, who was Logan, actually, uh, I think he had three poles in a row at one point, and, and I was never on the front row. And, you know, my racecraft and consistency in the races managed to, to get me across the line in that title, really. Uh, I had some DRS issues as well, but that's another topic. Uh, a, a lot of that, DRS A lot of DRS issues, right? issues throughout that year, <laughs> but... Wouldn't open, wouldn't close. Well, would change its mind about 20 times down the straight. So it would open, close, and oh, yeah, that went on for, I think, six of the nine rounds. So that never helped either. Um, but that consistency really helped me there. And I think I probably lacked that in my Formula Renault championship. I think I was quick, but made a few too many mistakes. And ultimately I I didn't scrape across the line, but had enough of a a buffer when I made a few errors. And then I think the F2 season was firstly by far my best year in racing, but I think I put everything together. I think, um, you know, I was quick, but also I was, you know, always there when I needed to be there. And especially with that format with two reverse grids that year, you needed to be there all the time in the in the top 10 to make sure you're in that reverse grid because if you DNF'd race one, you know, you, you're screwed for race one and two. Um, so I think that's a massive part of it. And obviously in F1 as well, it's an incredibly important part of the sport. We've got 23 races now and being consistently there when, when stuff inevitably happens um, is only going to put you in, in good stead. Now, you touched on something there. In Formula 3, you didn't qualify on the front row. Yet in Formula 2, the very next season, you dominated qualifying. I mean, stunning. What did you change? What happened over the winter? To be completely honest, I don't. I still don't know to this day. Um, yeah, I went through F3 with no pole positions, not even a, a front row. And then in, in F2, I think I qualified seventh in Bahrain on the first race third at Monaco and Baku and then I was on pole for the next five rounds so I don't know what I changed really I think I was just very in sync with the car uh, with the tires as well and I think my understanding of the F2 car was just better than what I had in F3 from whether it was a slightly better work ethic I think having COVID in the F3 season didn't help as well because we had the pre-season test about four months off and then straight into it. So I'd never really got that much of a chance to develop uh, myself through testing because we didn't have any. Whereas F2, we had a little bit more testing time. The races were a bit more spread out as well. So I had a bit more time to think about it. And yeah, I was just very in sync with the car. And um, yeah, there was some qualifying sessions where I could almost, you know, after the first lap go, okay, I know that the car is good enough for me to get pole. 
I just need to do my job correctly and, and you know, we, we should be able to do it, uh, which, you know, when you, I think when you can go into every qualifying session with that mentality of if I just do my job properly, it's going to be enough. It's a massive confidence boost. Do you think you've gone better as the cars have got quicker during your career? Do you feel more at one with the, the quicker the car, the, the better it feels? I, I think yes and no. I think I was probably more at home in the Formula Renault car than I was in the F3 car. But the F2 car was, uh, it just seemed to suit me very well, I would say. So I don't know if it's necessarily the speed of the car, but I think as you go up the championships, even in karting, it was a bit of a similar trend. The quicker the kart was, I seemed to generally get get stronger. But I think the further up you go, the more technical everything gets. Uh, you know, jump from F3 to F2, uh, the car had much more power, was much heavier, uh, and a big difference was the carbon brakes coming from steel brakes, which was took a little bit of getting used to. But, you know, getting on top of that and getting on top of the tyre management, doing pit stops, different compounds and stuff like that, adding in all those variables, I think for me, plays to my strengths, I would say. Uh, so I think when you add in something new, and, and the, the year I won Formula Renault, it was the first year of that car as well. So it was a brand new car. And I think having a focus on improving the car as well as my driving um, is, for some reason, quite important for me and, and you know helps me, I guess, focus on what feels good with the car, how I need to drive it to extract the most out of it as well. So I think you know in, in F1, obviously, the cars are constantly evolving. They're new every year. And every you know four or five years, they're completely different with the regs changes. So I think adding in the variables seems to, to help me, I would say, more than the, the speed. So given your stellar junior career, how hard was it to take a year out last year when you think that, you know, Charles Leclerc, he won in F2, didn't have to take a year out, George Russell the same. Even Joe Guan Yu, who was next to you in the press conference in Abu Dhabi 2021, he made the step and you didn't. Yeah, it was, was tough. Um, you know, I think firstly, for any racing driver, wants to be racing as much as they can and being in that position where the rules, because I, I'd won F2, said that I couldn't repeat F2, I quite literally had no more junior categories to race. So that was, I guess, nice, a nice problem to have in one ways, but still a problem nonetheless. And I found out more or less halfway through my F2 season that I wouldn't be making the step up to F1 the next year, no matter what I did. Um, which How was, much of a kick in the gut was that? It was, was tough to take. Um, you know, I, I, I felt like it was, I think, four rounds. The championship that year was only eight rounds, but four, four rounds into the season, uh, I'd just taken my first pole and, and the championship lead. So to then find out, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be making up the jump uh, to F1 next year, regardless of what I do from now, it hurt, uh, as, especially initially. But, you know, I think, it, if anything, it made me almost more determined to go, okay, I'm going to win this. And, you know, it, um, I guess, make myself have the issue of not having to race F2 again. That was ultimately what I wanted to do, was, was to put myself into that position of, you know, uh, saying the reason I'm not racing is because I've I've won the championship and can't race it again. That's what I really wanted to try and do. So it hurt, but I think, you know, as time went on, I was, was more at ease with that. And obviously we came up uh, with the deal to become a reserve driver last year, which I guess given the circumstances was the best that we could, we could do uh, with some private testing, um, but it, it still hurt. What did you learn during that year out? Quite a lot, I would say, in some ways, more than I ever intended. Uh, I think, you know, I took the sort of uh, mindset of, you know, I can't race this year, but I can try and learn all the sort of background stuff that you don't see on TV and F1, you know, simple stuff like how busy the, the schedule is for the drivers. Uh, you know, Melbourne last year was a perfect example for me last year. And, you know, I was pretty tired after that weekend without even driving. Um, so... You know, just getting into that schedule, getting into the routine, um, seeing what happens, you know, listening into all the debriefs and stuff like that, trying to learn as much as I could from Fernando and Esteban. What, what did you learn from those guys? Fernando in particular? I, I think, you know, I learned a lot from both. I think obviously Fernando's got a lot of experience under his belt and, you know, has been in, in a championship winning position before. 
so he knows what it takes to to build a team around him to to be world champions and he was you know incredibly insightful to watch and i think you know obviously i have to go race against him now so i don't want to <laughs> pump him up too much but you know just the capacity he had to think of everything else whilst driving was was pretty extraordinary and and in some ways inspirational so i think i went into last year with the mentality of trying to perfect all those other areas then for this year go back to adding in the driving really as fans of formula one you know that it's a high stakes sport the drivers and teams on the grid are putting their all into the ultimate goal of achieving that coveted podium spot at the end of the season and in order to do that they need to know they've got the best team possible working together as well And that's the same for small business owners. Whether you're growing your business or looking to get it off to a strong start, you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. And it's so easy to get started. All you need to do is create your job post online detailing the skills and requirements needed for the role, and their simple tools like screening questions will help you zone in on the candidates with the right experience so you can prioritise who you want to interview and hire. And I definitely recommend adding the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to let your network know that you're hiring. It might seem like a small thing, but it really does help spread the word. You've probably even noticed people using them yourself. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash grid. That's linkedin.com slash grid to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Oscar, a lot was made of the tug of war between Alpine and McLaren last summer. Given everything we know now, it seems McLaren were the only team to offer you a solid contract. Is that what made you so sure about going there? Um, Yeah, I mean, dealing with with McLaren was uh, extremely straightforward. And like you said, they, they put a contract on the table, no frills attached. Um, of we want you in the team for next year. You know, that was a massive show of confidence and it was extremely nice to be wanted and, and a massive factor in why I decided to go to McLaren uh, or to join McLaren. For me, I think obviously a lot happened last year and, you know, I think now a lot of the facts are out there to be read. But yes, the desire from McLaren to have me in their team and, and just the clarity of, of what my future was going to hold, because at that point it was pretty unclear for what would have been the second year running. So to have that clarity and something on the table was you know, extremely nice to have. And how have you found the atmosphere at McLaren? Because I remember back in the wrong Dennis days, it had there was the perception at least that McLaren was a bit cold, a bit grey. Of course it's changed. We're all in papaya now. And But how have you found it? It's been great so far, honestly. I feel very embedded in the team and, you know, everyone's been been great to work with so far. Very friendly, very nice. And, you know, I think there's definitely the passion and the energy there to, to get us back to the front. And, you know, I think obviously we're, we're not where we ideally want to be at the moment. And, you know, I'm sure for myself and Lando, of course, we want to be trying to win because that's what we've done to, to get into F1. And the team's no different, I feel. Um, so... You know, there's definitely the energy there. We've got good plans to help us move forward. Obviously, we've got a, a new wind tunnel coming online, a new simulator. So the plan is in place. And, you know, I think half the battle sometimes is recognizing where things are going wrong or where you need to improve. And I feel very confident that we've recognized uh, a lot, if not all of those areas. And now it's about putting in the hard work to, to address it all. A quick word on Lando. It's weird to think that you guys are almost the same age. What is he? He's a he's a year older than you. Yeah, I think two two years. Is it two? Yeah, okay. yeah well, 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 one younger. and a half, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, he's in his fifth year of Formula One as you come into to your first. How are you rubbing along together? Yeah, it's been been great so far. I've been getting along well, uh, which is always good. We're both. I guess very aligned with the team as well on you know what we we want to do. We've got very similar feedback to the team, which is which is nice. You know we're pushing the team in the same direction. 
where we've both got quite a similar mindset of we want to push the team forward and that's the most important thing at the moment because you know we don't want to be fighting for you know ninth or tenth or whatever it may be forever we want to be at some stage back at the front um, and I think we're both working very well together on, on trying to help the team wherever we can achieve that. When you look at Lando's data for example what impresses you about him? I think obviously I, I haven't looked at that many samples yet he's just quick really uh, I, you know there's no magic to it I think obviously he's been with the team for a long time now been in McLaren cars and and obviously this is his second year in in the new regulation cars as well so just picking up bits here and there but I think generally we've been driving in quite a similar way which is encouraging uh, also for the engineers it makes things a bit easier I guess but just he's just quick um, and you know I think he's proven that more than enough times uh, that he's you know a more than capable driver of uh, of being on the F1 grid. You mentioned the engineers there do you find it inspiring that your engineer, Tom Stallard, is a former Olympian? Yeah, it's it's obviously, you know, quite a unique background to enter into F1. And in some ways, I guess he knows the dedication that you put into a sport. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to him about some of his old rowing stories of the, I guess, sacrifices and dedication he had to put in. Um, Can you kind of relate to it? In some ways, yes. I think, you know, obviously rowing... In particular, it's a very, it's quite a short sport. The time frames that they're rowing for are not particularly long, but it's a massive power sport. So, you know, the things you have to do and the, the intriguing thing for me was the food that you have, <laughs> the amount of food that you have to eat was quite mind blowing. And obviously being an F1 driver, weight is quite a critical uh, area. Not so much now as it was in the past, but it's different aspects, I guess, but the same effort and same dedication of, you know, putting your life's energy into a job which is a sport that you love and and you know craving success so i think in some ways it's it's great to have that and also yeah he's you know we've been working together very well as, as driver and engineer as well which is of course the most important part have you discussed how much weight he can move in the gym uh no i haven't really um I, he's he's a he's a tall man and a bigger man than i am uh so i'm sure he'll probably be outdoing me and i'm sure in his heyday he would well and truly be outdoing yeah, me. yeah but your neck muscles will be stronger than his well yeah that i'll take that one <laughs> yes thank you tom i'm sure my neck muscles would win yes uh, oscar look it's been so great to have you on the pod and have a have a proper chat thank you for your time look just final one from me is if we were to hook up again in abu dhabi what would have been a good first season for you um i i think for me and uh, it's quite a boring answer i guess but just to learn and soak up as much as I can. Compared to the previous racing I've done, experience is a much different factor. You know, in the racing I've done before, you know, being in your second season was considered very experienced and third was almost unheard of. And, you know, Lando, who, as you pointed out, is only a year or two older than me, is in his fifth year already. 18 months. 18 months, yes. Uh, he's in his fifth year already. So I think having that experience and building up that bank of knowledge is super important. Results can fluctuate a lot so I think you know putting a specific number or target on results is is always difficult because it's always changing so much obviously as a team we've got our our targets of where we want to be um, which ultimately will will feed into what my own targets are but ultimately try and especially in the first half of the year or first part of the year learn as much as I can and get back up to speed because I haven't raced for a while um, is the most important thing and just putting the right processes in and starting everything in the right way and not building in any bad habits or anything like that. I think that's by far the most important thing. And then once I've learned all that stuff, then maybe we can start going, okay, you know, I want to finish here, but ultimately I want to get to a stage where if we can finish 10th and get a point, I want to say, okay, I can go and do that. Uh, or if we can, if we're capable of winning the race, you know, I want to say, you know, okay, I feel capable of winning the race and, and, you know, I've done everything I can to achieve that. So building all those foundations first is, uh, is what will lead to that point. I think if the car was capable of finishing on the podium at the next race, you would be capable of finishing on the podium. I don't think there's that thank much you. work to do, Oscar. <laughs> thank you. But thank you so much for your time. Best of luck with it all. Thank you very much.
Oscar's an impressive character, isn't he? Very calm and straightforward. A true no-nonsense Aussie, you could say. But what matters more than anything else in Formula One is speed. And we've seen enough from Oscar already, both in the junior formulas and in the opening couple of Grand Prix this year, to know that he's quick and consistent. When Oscar's McLaren is ready for podiums, I'm sure he'll deliver them. Thanks for your time, Oscar, and good luck racing in Melbourne this weekend. Enjoy it. Now, as ever, please send in your thoughts and stories about Oscar. Did you see him dominate the junior formulas? Have you seen him in the McLaren this year? Have you even watched him play cricket? Let me know at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter or use the hashtag f one beyond the grid and I'll read out some of your messages at the end of next week's show. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Paul Stoddart after last week. It seemed you loved many of Paul's stories and memories. Let's start with this from Brandon Edwards. Without doubt, the greatest episode so far. A man who remembers dates and that much detail is one to be respected. They were great days with Arrows, Jordan and Minardi. I'd love to have a pint with Stoddy. I could listen to him all day. Great stories. Well, thanks, Brandon, and I'm glad you enjoyed the show. And what about this from Chrysalis? I always admired Paul for his heroics in keeping Minardi on the grid, but this podcast really drove home how much integrity he has, and that trust between himself and Dietrich Mateschitz helped keep the team and its underdog status afloat even till today. Well, I agree with everything you say there, Chrysalis. Integrity is something Paul has by the bucket load, isn't it? And finally, let's hear from Matt Thorne. That was the episode I've been waiting for and I didn't even realise it. Paul offered insight into the most exclusive club in the world, Formula One team owners, and it was brilliant. It's a shame he didn't stay in the sport for longer. His voice and sensibilities are needed today. Well, thanks for getting in touch, Matt, and I'm glad you enjoyed the show as well. Well, that's almost it for this week. Please remember to send in your thoughts and stories about Oscar in time for next week's show. And do leave us a rating or a review if you've enjoyed the episode. We love reading them. A few other things before I go. F1 Nation's preview of Oscar's home race is out now, featuring Aston Martin team principal Mike Crack and Aussie Grand Prix boss Andrew Westercott. Check that out on your podcast player by searching for F1 Nation and playing our Australian Grand Prix preview. And check out Formula1.com for video, features and analysis from the race weekend. If you join F1 Unlocked, you'll get free access to some exclusive stuff too. F1.com is the place to go. Thanks for listening. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.